So today, we're going to deal with a topic called heaven on earth. Okay? Now, it's a concept that is sometimes divisive, sometimes misunderstood, because the Jehovah Witnesses have owned that particular narrative, that's one. And then two, you think heaven is many, many kilometers above you. So heaven on earth is kind of difficult because you imagine, because every time you look up to heaven, correct? So to you, because we have geospatial minds, we cannot imagine how heaven is existent and present where we are. We prefer it being at distance. So you imagine when you die, your soul is traveling through a tunnel of light because people who've died before have told you that they saw the light. So you imagine <laughs> that when you die, <laughs> uh, they tell you, don't go into the light. It is very funny. Where should you go? Into the darkness. Uh, amen? So I want to go to the story real quickly. And I want to put something to you that we will prove shortly. But I want to put something to you that there is an inaccurate way to worship God. Okay? There is a wrong way to worship God. Now, I know this is not popular in modern thought because your democratic brain has taught you everyone has an opinion. Okay? And we should respect everyone's opinion. Now, unfortunately, we come from a theocratic kingdom and we have a dictator for our God. The only difference between this dictator and earthly dictators is he loves you enough to die for you. The earthly dictators don't love you at all, so you die for them. You understand? That is the difference. So when you understand that difference, and you go to the story of David. Now, David is an interesting guy. We all know David. He's ascended to the throne. And then he's interested in uh, bringing the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolizes the presence of God, into the city that he has built. It is a noble cause, correct? So what David does is very interesting. He organizes a church of 30,000 people. Please go to the scripture, the, the long version. So he puts together 30,000 people, okay? Now, if you are going to have a crusade, 30,000 leaders of Israel is a very interesting number, okay? Okay? Now, these guys are ready to do a powerful praise and worship service, okay? What is their objective? Their objective is to bring God into their city. So in other words, they are like us. Uh, you know, Nixon, come, let, us, let me show you how we do it in modern churches and how it was then. Please come. Um, clap for Nixon. Nixon is uh, very bold. You understand? So this is how we do it in church. We start, um, don't listen to the voice, listen to the words. Eh? Amen, itende, yeah. See, that's what we do, okay? Then after we've done Amenitendea, we go slow. Amenitendea. Amenitendea. And then we say things like, let us now invite the presence of God. You, you know that? See, you've done it. Why are we pretending? <laughs> okay, you've been part of it, all right? Where, where the difference between praise and worship is how slow the song is and how like a lemon your face looks and how you lift your hand, okay? So David, just stand there, don't, don't, don't go yet. It says, he arose and went, and went with who? All the people, okay? Who are with him at Baal Judah and Kiriath Jerim to bring up from there, the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned above the cherubim. 
So what are they doing? They're not just bringing the Ark of the Covenant. David's objective is to bring the presence of God into his situation. Now I need to give you a bit of background. David in this place has learned that while this Ark was in Nacon's house, it had prospered him. You understand? So it had worked for him. Okay, so what he's trying to do, he's trying to bring the presence of God into his circumstance. Cindy, and that is why we open our meetings with prayers. Because let us invite the presence of God. So he's doing that, okay? And they set the ark of God upon a new cart. In other words, they bought a new car to transport this thing. So they're doing things right. It's a new cart, okay? And brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill, okay? And Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. So what have we done? We want to bring the presence of God, so we've prepared a vehicle. We've prepared a way of bringing the presence of God into our city, into our surrounding, into our tent. In fact, into the place that we've prepared for God. Correct? We are good so far? So let's continue. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Very interesting. Hills refer to high places. Okay? So it was on a high place. With the ark of God... And Ahio went before the ark. Okay? And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord with all their might. You understand? I will dance like David danced. You know that song? So that's what they're doing. They've got a nice praise and worship way. This, this guy. <laughs> Horrible PA, this one. Okay? So, they've got, they're playing before the Lord with all their might, with songs, with lyres, with harps, with tambourines, with castanets and cymbals. This is a serious praise and worship service. Correct? Are you following me? It's serious, Okay? And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, they came to where? Nacon's threshing floor. What does that tell you? A threshing floor is a place for testing. You understand? It is a place for separating wheat and chaff. It is a place where God brings you to see whether what you're doing can stand the test. Correct? And then he says, Uzzah put his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it. The, for the oxen had stumbled and shook it. Now, this begins to be interesting because the, we know God is very intentional. So he brings his ark to a threshing floor. Okay? At this threshing floor, the oxen shake. The new car shakes. Okay? Now listen. We are carrying precious cargo. Okay? So we are carrying precious cargo. If it is to fall, what is our duty? To, to hold it. Correct? So what did Uza do wrong? Uh, where have you gone, Ella? <laughs> okay? What did Uzzah do wrong? Because the next sentence is even more confusing. And the anger of God was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for touching the ark, and he, day, he died there by the ark of God. Now let's ask ourselves a question. We have a nice praise and worship service. 
praise and worship. Okay. Clearly he struggles with singing, but continue. So praise and worship. Keep singing. Okay. So praise and worship service. To who? To God, right? Then this praise and worship caravan meets a threshing floor. And then suddenly we are about to lose the very symbol of the presence of God. What is your idea? Let us keep the presence of God. But that spells death to Uzzah. So definitely God is giving us a message. Isn't he? So what is the message? Now you may sit down. There are a number of things hidden in this text. And I encourage you to go read the rest of it because this is not the subject of my teaching. I am laying a foundation. Now, if you look at this correctly, it makes sense in the natural. Okay? Because we have a box to transport, put it on a cart, and transport it. Now, why is this important? This is how the Philistines had brought it. You understand? They had put it on oxen and brought it to Israel. Does that make sense? So what David was doing is he was simply copying what the, the Philistines had done. So what is the first problem? Don't copy the Philistines. <laughs> Do you understand? First problem is the Philistines. So what's the issue? You cannot carry the presence of God with the systems you learned in the world. Number one, the presence of God can never be brought into a situation using the systems you've known in the past. Do you understand? It may have been successful uh, then. But now that you've come into the light, you cannot continue to do things like you did then. Do you understand? Second story is this are uh, being led by oxen. You understand? In other words, that the human intellect has been made passive. There is no human sweat to bring God into the presence. Do you understand? We have put it on automatic. In other words, we know which songs to play. Me song Nikki play na joni ni meshika God. We we all have any I like how you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm saying. And I know you are guilty. You understand? Third story, if you would go to the descriptions of their names, I just want to show you something interesting. Uza means strength. Okay? Ahio, his brother, means brother. Fratano. Okay? <laughs> so, what does it mean? That if you try to contain God with your strength, instead of the ark falling, you die. <laughs> Think about it. If something is about to fall, and I want to catch it, and I die, the next sentence should say, the ark fell. <laughs> See, it's logical. Yes. If I'm going to steady something, and I die, that thing should naturally? That means that I cannot contain the presence of God with my uza, my strength. If you read later on, that place, that threshing floor, it's called the breach of strength. It means not by might, not by power, but by his spirit. So what were they trying to do? They were trying to bring the presence of God into Jerusalem by strength. What is our strength? I run a social media company. How come I don't tell my people to advertise masterclass? I'm on TV and radio. 
every day. Why don't I advertise masterclass? Because that would be my... Do you understand? Okay? So that place is called Perezuza. The breach of strength. Gath is a wine press. Okay? Now, if you continue reading, it says that it's put in Obed-Edom's house, the Gittite. The Gittite is from Gath, a wine press. So, what, what, is, what is Christ saying? Basically, what is being said, that for David to transition and be able to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem, there had to be a wine press. Okay, what does that mean? That for you to be able to come into the place where you can bring God into your circumstance, you need to be able to be pressed out of your old wine skin. Do you get it? So what is the what did David do? If you read later on, and I'm just laying a foundation, you'll realize that he goes back to the law, okay, Leviticus. And what does he do? He reads that the Ark of the Covenant is to be carried by the Levites. Correct? All right? So are you seeing the mistakes? It's just a bit of thunder. Are you realizing the mistakes? So number one, how do you bring the Ark of the Covenant? It has to be carried by those he has chosen to carry it. Number one. Are you seeing then it says, at every sixth pace, David sacrificed. Okay? And when he got into the city, he and the father's houses, okay, distributed bread. Very interesting. What does bread signify? The word. So the presence of God must come into the city how? Number one, by there being those who are called and chosen by him, bearing the weight of bringing God into the city. You cannot bring God into a city without bearing that weight. There is no ox. It's just you. That's one. Second, the authorities over that city must be able to distribute not just the sacrifice, but bread to everyone. Do you understand? Now, I know this story seems a bit confusing. Now, allow me to confuse you a bit more. Am I allowed? <laughs> okay? I want you to go to Genesis and the story of Jacob. I'll take you through a few scriptures, then I'll tie them in together, okay? Now, in the story of Jacob, you all know the story. Jacob is running away from Esau. Okay, then he falls asleep, correct? And when he falls asleep, he sees a ladder, okay? And on this ladder, you've got angels coming up and down, okay? Now, we know that story. God promises him a lot of things. I'll not dwell on that. I'll just go to um, verse 19. Just go to 19 for me. Okay, so it says, and jo Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone he had under his head and he set it up for a pillar monument to the vision in his dream. And he poured oil on its top in dedication. And he named the place Bethel, meaning the house of? But the name of the city at first was Luz. Okay. So I want to ask you a question. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. All right. So you've entered the house of God. Senior. Now describe for me, did you ever see angels coming up and down? Because, 
I, I told you allow me to confuse you some more. So am I allowed? Okay. Because I need to unwire what you think you know. Okay? Because every Sunday you say, I was glad when they say to me, come and let us go to the house of the Lord. So that place where you went, do you see angels coming up and down? So where did you go? I'm asking a question. You see, the problem with us Christians is we use terms without referencing what it means. Because Jacob sleeps and he says when he sees angels coming up and down a ladder, that is a house of God. Now that is strange. You see, if he saw a roof, walls, and a door and called it a house, it would make? But he sees angels coming up and? And then he calls it the house of? So do you know the house of God? Now I want you to, t now, with that background, let me ask, what is the house of God? Sir, you look very smart. <laughs> there's, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. There's a reason why I'm asking, because I want to correct your theology to the accurateness of the word. Okay? You see, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to remove the Philistine cut, I'm trying to remove the oxen, and I'm trying to bring you into the accurate understanding of what the house of God is. So that you are not forever stuck in the place for, by the way, to Kianza meeting to Liomba. Okay? You're not stuck in the place for your praise and worship, Missy we feel. What will you feel? So that's, that's what we ask. And then after the service, we say, I'll go to the Bamba. I'll go to the Haji. Yani unge kwa tuwa. So, can I then say that the house of God accurately is the place where you see angels descending and ascending from heaven. No, you, you, I'm posing so that you can disagree. Can I say, I repeat myself, that the house of God is the place where angels Descend and ascend. Can I make that argument? Can I? I'm allowing you time to digest so that we, I can move on. Because unless I move forward, unless we agree here, I will lose you completely next step. Yes. Microphone. My question is, mm. this descending and ascending of angels, is it literal? Okay. You see, here's the problem. When you understand an angel uh, to be something very amazing, then you're stuck. But if you know angel means messenger, it becomes easier. The term angel actually means messenger. You know that. Okay. If you didn't know, the term angel means messenger. Do you understand? One who carries a message. Are we okay? Okay. So, to translate it again, then the house of God is the place where the one who carries a message is able to ascend and descend. Are we getting warmer? Are we getting warmer? Yeah. Okay. Can I give you proof? Go to Matthew. It says, chapter 6. You know it. It's the Lord's Prayer. It says, Your kingdom, your will be done, as it is in? So shall we pray. 
that the accurate prayer is about heaven and earth ascending and descending in the same time. That is why it starts, our Father who art in? Okay. Can I give you more proof? Okay. We are seated where? With Christ in heavenly. And then Christ also said that he dwells in? In you, correct? So, you are in two places at the same? So you're supposed to ascend and because who did God send? Go into? Who did he send? You. So who's the angel? Okay. Guy. See twende pole pole. An angel is a when Jesus came, who did he send? And who is seated with him in heaven and also present on earth? So who is supposed to ascend and descend? So who is the house of God? Go to Kings and I want to, you to... You all know Elijah, right? I want to show you the duality of Elijah and I'll show you two scriptures from Kings. Are we good to go? Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts live, before whom I... So, listen, he's talking to one of Ahab's soldiers. And he's saying, as the Lord lives, before whom I stand. Now, question. Is he before the captain or before the Lord? Both. Because he says, Elijah says to the captain. He's not telling God. And he says, before whom I stand. I will surely show myself to Ahab today. Next uh, scripture, the 17 one, 1 Kings 17 verse 1. Elijah the Tishbite of the temporary residence of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I So he's standing before Ahab and so what is he doing? He's able to ascend and descend at the same time. Do you understand? There shall be no dew, no rain these years, but according to my word. That tells you that the prayer that God listens to is the prayer that is both in heaven and on earth. That's why we abuse a statement that we say, whatever is bound, you bind on earth is bound also in? Am I opening your eyes? Elam, please ask your questions. I'm not even in a hurry to, 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 to teach this. Because if I teach it in a hurry, I will leave you in a muddle. Okay? Um, yes. Now, um, this part in the Bible where we are supposed to judge angels. Yes, there you go. Now, uh -huh. where does that come from? Because he, then there's also another statement that he was made slightly lower than the angels. We were made slightly lower than angels, yes. Yeah. yeah. And then, of course, there's that other statement where people say angels fly because they travel light. Okay. But that's just with our own light <laughs> note. <laughs> let's, let's, let's understand a few things. If you go to the book of Revelation, I want to demystify. The term angel is both referring to a man that has been sent and a celestial being, okay? Now, if you look at the book of Revelation, it says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, right. So, correct? Ah, yeah, so you, okay, let's read it. Go to Revelation chapter 2. Okay, just go there. Uh, it says, Elam doesn't have it there, so just go there. Anyone read the first church that is mentioned there? I think we can reduce the volume now. Anyone who's there? Yeah, well, these digital Bibles. Revelation is Ukomwisha Bible. It has 21 chapters. So if you go to chapter 1, there is, the next one is chapter 2. Chapter 2, just start from verse 1. Revelation 
chapter 2 verse 1 mm -hmm. to the angel of the church in Ephesus write okay pause there to the angel of the church in Ephesus now question does God write to celestial angels or to earthly angels who was he writing to he was writing to a man you understand? Because he's telling John to write. There is no way John is writing so that the angel in heaven can read. <laughs> Guys, okay. Who reads that letter? Men or angels? Men, correct? So when he's writing to the angel of the church, who is he referring to? Do you get it? So the term, you see, the, where it's messing with your head is you're not equating angel to messenger. But you, you see, secular people understand it. Because they sang, I'll be your star. I'll be your angel. <laughs> Let me not say all the words because I'm saved. <laughs> Do you understand? Yeah. You understand? Do you get it? The one who bears the message is the angel. That is why this is being right to, written to the angel of the church because his job is to receive the message and give it to the church. Do you understand? Are we okay? Or you're still stuck with uh, being called? Are we okay? Are we okay? But then you are, you are free to say you're not okay. C can I move forward? Can I move forward? Now, why am I bringing this story? There's something interesting that happened to the church. Okay? If you read the book of Acts, you see a super church. Okay? This church has people whose shadows heal people. Correct? This church, when it walks into a city, it turns upside down. They walk in Ephesus and they say, the guys who've turned the world upside down have come here also. Sindio, we have a church which when they stand to speak, 3,000 people got, got saved, right? We have a church that what happens is they, their numbers are added day by day. We have a church where the giving is so generous that not only did the preacher have a Range Rover, but no one lacked. Because you know in churches today, only one person has the Range Rover. The rest of us. You understand? Okay? So my question is, my question is, we've read who the true house of God is, correct? We have a picture of how prosperous David's and Solomon's temple was, correct? We know that the disciples, when they were left, they changed this world in less than 100 years, correct? So the question is, one, we know there is a wrong way to bring the presence of God into the city. We know that, correct? Now, therefore, I put it to you that the disciples knew how to bring God into a city, Correct? Because it can be argued everywhere they went, they won the cities over to God. Correct? So my question to you, and this is now goes into a bit of history, what happened? How did we come? Listen, we know that the Bible works that if Peter did great miracles, then the people who followed Peter should have done much more. See, that's how the Bible works. He says, greater works than these shall you. The, greater, the, the glory of the latter church shall exceed that of the former. Correct? So we, 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 we know this. So the question is why is the revival in Kenya 1960, why didn't it become better? Okay? Why is the preaching community a laughing stock? Why is it that for me to teach you now, I need to spray people with the doom? You know those? <laughs> Why is it that people are eating grass? Why is it that a preacher can claim to have taken a selfie in heaven? <laughs> 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 
No, see, these things are happening. Okay, people are drinking paraffin in the name of God. No, this is happening in Africa. You understand? Someone, Jewsy, just two, three weeks ago, in church said he had a direct line to and if you give him special tithe, he'll give you the number too. So, question. What happened? What happened to this church where Stephen, who was a deacon, his job was to serve plates of food. Somehow, in the midst of serving plates of food, it is said miracles were happening. How did it become that now we have a church where only one person standing at the front can do miracles and cast out demons. What happened? Aren't you curious? So let me answer. Go to, to, to where Jesus said, beware the Herodians. Okay, this is in Mark. Not in Mark, the book Mark. <laughs> in Mark 8.15 it says, And Jesus repeatedly and expressly charged and admonish them. Now, you see when Jesus is repeating, okay, and expressly saying something, it means that we must pay careful attention to what he's about to say. Correct? Then he says, look out, keep on your guard, and beware of the devil. Beware of demons. Beware of what? The living of the Pharisees and the living of the Herodians. Very interesting statement. Now to ask you a question. Most of us know who a Pharisee is. Correct? Who are the Herodians? There's a car, KBN 800Z and KBX 775. You're blocking someone. Oh, hey. None of us? <laughs> KBN 800Z, KBX 775, none of us, we're good. Okay? So we know who the Pharisees are. They were this bunch of legalists who still exist today and how they check on your Christianity is, my brother, how is your quiet time? Are you spending time with the Lord? How many chapters are you reading? Will you complete reading the Bible in one year? Yes, I said it. Because all that is nonsense, eh? by the way. Because it says pray without ceasing. So if I'm praying without ceasing, what is QT? I'm sorry, I ask hard questions. Listen, listen. If I am consistently connected to God, at what point is QT? It means at every point. I should be able to bear fruit in season and out of? There's no off season. You understand? So the Pharisees, I do not want to explain that. I will explain that in another series called The Enemies in the Land. But what I want to explore is the living of Herod and the Herodians. Because it is a passage of scripture we've allowed back into the church without knowing. Now, remember I said you cannot bring the presence of God into a city using a Philistine cut? Remember that? Okay. So who's Herod and the Herodians? Herod and the Herodians are very interesting people. Herod and the Herodians are the ones who had built the temple. One. It was called Herod's temple. Not God's temple anymore. It's whose? Okay. Very careful to note. Number two, Herod was appointed by the government of Rome. Cindy, guess who Herod get, got to appoint? The high priest. <laughs> so Herod builds a temple, okay, is appointed by Rome, and he gets to appoint the high priest. So who's the boss of the high priest? God or Herod? Okay. So Jesus is saying, he's prophesying, moving forward, beware of who? 
Pharisees and the Herodians. So the question is we know if Pharisees exist until today, and they are there, they wear sackcloth, because the only way you can repent is looking like you've repented. Because we skip the scripture that says, rend your hearts and not your... It says, rend your hearts and not your garments. So don't... <laughs> so we know the Pharisees exist. So Herod and the Herodians are tricky. Because if you are an average Jew going to the temple, you would assume that the temple you are going to is the one that God had established. Senior, you would assume that the order of worship that is there is what God has established. You would assume that the high priest has been appointed by God. See, that's what you would assume. No one questioned the high priest. Senior, because he represents the interests of God. Correct? Now, Herod was appointed by Rome. Okay? Now, in this, we can clearly see that Jesus is prophesying that this Herod and the Herodians will not stop. Sindio? So the question to us today is who did Herod and the Herodians become? So, now it brings me to a very interesting story of a guy called Constantine. Correct? Now, Constantine said, it's very easy. Let's stop fighting. I am tired of persecuting Christians. Okay? So that sounds like a good thing. Let's call a truce. I've been slapping, I've been slapping you all the time. Okay. I've been slapping you all the time. Let's call a truce. Okay? So how is this? Please research this. Okay? Even those who are watching, research this carefully and find out the truth. So he says, listen, let's agree. Let's make Rome and the church the same thing. Cindy. Okay? So you, this you know from history. Correct? So he said it's very simple, very, very simple. What we will do is we will make your Christianity the official religion of the state. So, only one condition. I remain Lord of the state and the church. Does that shock you? Okay. Now, to prove that this church is the right one, Jesus said that Peter is the rock upon which the church is built. We all know that's not true because I've taught this before. Senior, the rock upon which the church is built is that the revelation that Jesus is the Christ. The only head of the church can be Christ. Now, the problem with that statement is what guys don't realize is that in Rome, the, 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 the emperor was called the son of God. Okay? So when people said Jesus, the son of God, guys were like, who of the two is the real son of? Okay. When people said Jesus is Lord, in Rome, there was only one Lord. It was the emperor. So when these two entities are to merge, there needed to be a concession, an agreement. So, they agreed on a few things which you enjoy today. They agreed that uh, this Passover of yours, let us change it to Easter. Okay? And that's why you have rabbits, 
that lay eggs. So you have Easter eggs from rabbits. Easter bunny. See, it's a rabbit. What's the difference between a bunny and a rabbit? <laughs> a rabbit you can eat and a bunny. A bunny is a pet. Okay. So it's a bunny. Okay. Okay? So you inherited that. On this other side, you inherited Christmas and a Christmas tree. Okay? But that's not even the big deal. What you inherited next was a structure that was Herodian. That the emperor got to say who is bishop or pope. Okay? And he said that the pope is the representative of Christ on, which sounds like a good thing, except the representative of Christ on earth, we all know is a corporate body of Christ, not an individual. I don't represent Christ because I stand in front of you more than you represent Christ. So you know that. So what is happening? Rome is appointing a king who can tell you who is your high priest. We are back where? Now here is another problem. You know the Bible has two classes of leadership. Okay? There is a fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. You know them, senior. And then you've got the bishops and the elders or deacons. Correct? Right? Now, the fivefold ministry, who appoints them? Christ. The bishops and deacons, who appoints them? Men. See, it's Timothy who was sent to appoint a bishop. It is Timothy who's told who an elder is. It is the disciples who decided who the deacons were. Correct? So, in the leadership of the church, who used to lead the church? The fivefold or the bishops? How can it be? You see, this is the problem with your tradition. We just said that the disciples appointed the bishops. So, how can it be that the bishops led the church? Okay, let's try again because I know there's a lot of tradition in your head that's breaking. Okay. Who appoints apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists? Christ. Okay, they're called the offices of Christ. It says he appointed some to be prophets, pastors. It is Christ. Okay? Who appoints bishops and deacons? Men. They're not offices of? Okay. So, which one leads what? The bishops lead the pastors or the pastors lead the bishops? You see how much tradition you've been taught, Paka? It's a hard statement to say. Okay. Let us go pole pole. In the book of Timothy, who is Timothy? Timothy is the son of Paul. Sindio? He's the son of an apostle. He is sent to appoint a bishop. <laughs> okay. So, you know the rules of a bishop, Sindio? He should be the husband of one wife, of good character, Sindio? Please put that there, it's in Timothy. Let's put it there, let's go through it, pole pole, who a bishop is, Sindio? Okay? So you know those rules. Okay, I just want them to go up so I can tell you. Please open it in your own Bible because I want to show you something that's very weird. Okay? So, it says she'll be the husband of one wife. Sindio. Who is writing this? Paul. Okay? Now, if I'm going to write to you a law, I should at least qualify. Sindio. Okay, so to Andepole. Paul. Was Paul married? Okay. Did Paul have a good character? (laughs) 
Paul was a murderer. If we were to go by Paul's standards, then Paul did not qualify to be a bishop. <laughs> My brothers, have you found it? It's in First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter three. Elamam Potter. Timothy is <laughs> okay. Now a bishop, superintendent of Asia, must give no grounds for accusation, but must be above reproach. Now listen. Did Paul have grounds to be accused? He did, isn't it? So he disqualifies number. Number two, the husband of one? Did he have a wife? Disqualified. Circumspect, circumspect and temperate and self-controlled. He must be sensible and well-behaved and dignified and lead an orderly, disciplined life. Okay? Again, Paul, the angry one who kills. You understand? Now, if you look at this scripture, does Paul qualify? So there, you land in trouble. Because we do not then understand who a bishop is. Okay. It is first Timothy. Paul is an apostle. Nixon come. Okay? Okay? Sir, so, and I want to call a bishop. Chege, come. I called you a bishop today, so come. Because I promised him I'll explain. Do you know, all, all my male friends know when I call them, I call them bishop. Now you, I'm going to explain. So that's a joke I make, okay? So consider I am Paul, okay? Because I'm shorter than the two gentlemen. Paul was short, okay? So I am Paul, okay? This is my son in the faith. Cindy, I send him to install him as bishop. <laughs> okay? So, in the order of things, who's leading who? Nixon is leading the bishop and he's the son to the apostle. So, what is the correct order in that verse? It is apostle, son, bishop. You know, you're struggling because you're wondering, see, Archbishop Nani, just <laughs> forget, your, forget your Philistine cut. Let's look at how God ordered it. Sindio, look at the apostles in Jerusalem, correct? They're sitting, they've become very busy in the book of Acts. Sindio, they say, let us, it is not good for us to be waiting on Tables. We will appoint deacons. Sindio. So again, the apostles appoint deacons. So this now are deacons. Okay? So how is it that now the deacons run some churches? Guys, am I, am I, am I causing you to think? Now, here's the issue. When you take these two, okay, now he's the bishop, okay? He's the bishop. He's appointed by man, correct? And then you put the son and the apostle here, okay? Here's the problem. His appointing authority is man, Sindio. Who does he report to? Okay. So, his job then becomes to please who? So this apostle in his church, what happens to me? Unangolea. You always wonder what happens to the spirit people in your church. They only sent on a mission. It's the truth, it has happened to you. Okay, can I just speak 
sits master class. Yeah. So we are allowed to interrogate issues. So here's the problem. Again, if the bishop is appointed by men, Cindy, what will he teach? What men want to? Yeah. So it says in the last days people will have itchy ears. Looking for bishops who will tell them what they want to? Okay? Again, beware the Herodians. When the high priest is about to crucify Jesus, what does he practice? Democracy. He gives the people what they So what happens in this church? That the people are always doing what? He's always doing what the people want. That's what churches are about nowadays. Our Sunday schools are about pleasing parents. Our praise and worship, we will even tweak it so that the transition from club to church is easy for you. So we'll make some songs in the club as Christian as possible. So it's quite a culture shock. Why? Because we've changed God's order. Are you seeing where, where we land in trouble? Okay? In the other way, where we have deacons, okay? So you have deacons. Now, remember Ahio and Uza? What did Ahio mean? Brothers. So together, it's the strength of? There are some very interesting brothers in the Bible. The first group of brothers are called the 12 tribes of Israel. And when one of them had a nice coat given by the father, and he was sent with bread from who? The father. What did the brothers do? Okay. When the bread of heaven was sent... And he was sent among 12 brothers. What did one brother do? He sold him. That's why I keep telling you God is not a Democrat. What these things are, they are Philistine cuts by which we try to bring God into the earth and it's not working. Or is it? Let's be honest. Is it working? So what must happen? What must happen? We must restore order. Okay? Now let me exp Don't go, Buana. Let me ex Don't go. Hey, Nixon. Suurudi kwenye ulikuwa. This karate master. Ulikuwa uku. Let me help this guy. Okay? Now... How is the kingdom of God to come into a city? Okay? See, that's a story we're discussing. It says it must come carried by a Levite. Who's a Levite? One who was chosen by God. Correct? All right? So, Paul and Timothy represent these two that are chosen by God. Correct? Now, if you read the story in um, Chronicles, in Second Samuel rather, you will notice that in this equation, there is someone called the heads of the houses. Okay? The heads of the fathers' houses. Remember I talked about that. Okay? So to bring the presence of God, we need a father of the house, okay? And we need Levites, okay? So the father of the house is distributing bread. Remember that story? And sacrificing. And what are the Levites doing? Carrying the presence of God. See, that's how David brought the Ark of the Covenant. So look at the disciples of Jesus. 
We should not be waiting tables distributing bread. We should be occupied with prayer and meditating on the Remember the messenger brings what? So, <laughs> are we okay? All right? I'm taking you Old Testament, New Testament. Okay? So, the role of a bishop, he's an overseer. He's a supervisor of what? The distribution of bread. Standing for the word of? These two guys, what is their job? To hear accurately from God, okay? And bring this bread that he can distribute. <laughs> guys, am I making sense? This is God's order. This is why the disciples said it was not a statement of? Pride, because that's what we mistake. They said we need to give ourselves to prayer and to study of the word. So, so that what happens? The natural product of this relationship is a son who's been washed by the word. When he grows up, he becomes a father, correct? Sindio, this is why you find Paul writes to the church in Corinthians and then now he starts saying the church in Corinthians greetings to the church that meets at so-and-so's house. So he has a church within a church. Do you get it? So these guys were called the father's houses in the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, if we needed to find you, what did we do? You are of the house of Judah, the house of the clan of so-and-so, the house of so-and-so. So for God to locate you, he locates you according to your father's house. You understand? So in the body of Christ, and we understand the Old Testament is the picture of the new, okay? So what happened in the New Testament, okay? The Levitical priesthood was replaced by the fivefold ministry. Now, their job, okay, is to make sure that bread is distributed this way, okay, so that the masses can feed. Can I give you another example? Okay. Jesus, again, now please join him, eh? I want to show an example. Please join him on this side, okay? So Jesus wants to feed a few thousand people. Okay? It's very interesting. He says, make them sit in groups of 5, 10, 50. Correct? All right? Then he takes the bread. This is the bread. It's Microsoft bread. It's very expensive bread. <laughs> okay? He gives thanks. This is Jesus. He gives thanks and he breaks it. Correct? Now we all know that bread represents the word. Send you. So he gives the bread to his disciples. Correct? The disciples distributed among the companies of 50. Okay? And then downwards, all the way to the person who needs to eat. So how does bread come to the entire body of Christ? Christ must give out bread to his disciples. His disciples must distribute the bread to overseers and bishops. Then these bishops must distribute the bread to the last person. Do you understand? Because if we break this chain, okay, this guy is wired for distribution, not revelation. Do you get it? You see, it's, it's, it's simple math, okay? The amount of bread he receives is a lot than what he does, okay? 
So if we switch positions, what will happen? And we keep blaming the bishop while he's boring in church. <laughs> Do you understand? Therefore, you realize that the bishop does not have a speaking role, according to Paul. He does not say, let him be eloquent. Does he? He does not say, let him be able to stand and project his voice. Instead, the bishop's role is to be a living letter. So, what is Paul checking in Timothy? He is checking to see this word, okay, remember the word is bread. It's supposed to make you grow up, correct? So, Paul is saying, before you can elevate her to be a distributor of bread, check how mature they are in the word. And then he describes to you how someone mature in the word is like. Okay? And he speaks about his ability to take care of a family. Because he later says, how can he take care of God's house if he cannot keep his own house in order? Does that make sense? So he's not checking marital status. He's checking character. You understand? So if this guy has met the character requirement, okay, then he does not need to speak. His life can be copied by Okay, am I making sense? Yes. This is how the body of Christ is supposed to work. You see? So that now what happens is, you know what we lack most in our lives? We lack examples. Because we broke this order. Every time you have a challenge, you're like, how do I do this thing? Because there's no one in your life to tell you, by the way, I used to be like you. Do you get it? Now, because of that, what has happened is now you've taken this guy and you've put him here. Okay? The only thing he can do is listen to Joyce Meyer and copy and teach you. Oh, yeah. Have I lied? You understand? Mm. So what happens? You quickly realized you've been on the same diet for 10? Yeah. Because he does not, his capacity in the body is not revelatory. It is distributory. You understand? And how does he distribute? It is him who is the living letter. You get These guys who God has called apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors, let me define to you their job. I need one more volunteer. Uh, you've been promoted. Okay? Please clap for the apostle as she... Okay? So, apostle, prophet, teacher, pastor, Evangelist, okay? So how do these five bring revelation into the body of Christ? Okay? The apostle's job is to figure out doctrine. Okay? They sit and discuss things like, is God three or one? So it's the apostles who sat and decided. They sit and decide, do you need to get circumcised or not? Okay? Now, the prophet's job, by the way, is not to tell future events. This is the problem. Because <laughs> every time you see a prophet, what will happen tomorrow? <laughs> that is a diviner and a seer. The work of a prophet 
is to check and measure the measurement of the temple. You know, every time the, a prophet sees a temple in the Old and New Testament, you see them measuring it. Have you ever wondered why? And the length of it was 60 cubits by 60. You've read those things. Yeah. And you always wonder, why are you boring me with uh, language I don't understand? Let me explain. When God speaks doctrine here, he gives this one the ability to check if the building that is being built in the spirit has met the standard. He says prophecy is for the edification of the saints. It is for the building up of the saints. So what happens between these two is this guy, Paul says, I have built like a master builder. Okay? Now, if you're building, you must have someone to check your building. So what is the work of the prophet? The work of the prophet is to come and say, by the way, umekosa two millimeters at just. Do you understand? That is what the prophet is supposed to see. That's why it says it's for edification, not for scarification. <laughs> you know, I have seen the devil is coming. Kami kuna trial la kuja. But nime kuambea. You know what you should ask that, 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 that prophet? When is the devil not after me? He's always after you. He's always a roaring lion. After you pray, he'll be a roaring lion. Before you pray, he was a roaring? Looking for who to devour. You understand? Guess who's the sheep? If he's looking for us to devour, he's not looking for the wolves. He's looking for the sheep. So there's no revelation when he tells you he's after you. He's always been after you, by the way. <laughs> and after you bind him and things like that, he will still be after? Good. So that is not the work over? And their prayers do not change the devil's job. I don't understand. Did you get it? Do you understand what the work of the prophet is? So what is the work of the teacher? What does a teacher do? He has received a curriculum and a marking scheme. You understand? So what does he do? He takes the teaching and breaks it into bite-sized pieces that the students can take. Do you understand the work of a teacher? So what does the pastor do? The pastor is your coach. He is your tutor at home. He is the guy who when umekwama na homework kenye teacher alikupea, anakuambia hapa usijali, tunezai solve. Do you get it? He walks with you. Do you get it? So what does the evangelist do? The evangelist's job, by the way, is not just to get people born again. The evangelist's job is to announce, guys, there is a new class. To Maliza class? One. There is a new revelation in Mepatikana, Jerusalem. We no longer need to get circumcised. You understand? So Philip was a good evangelist. Let me explain to you how it's interesting. Philip goes and evangelizes an entire place. Okay? Then he does something interesting. People ask him, Sasa, uyu Holy Spirit tutafili wa haja na wambia ngoje ni kwanza. He goes and gets Peter and John. Remember that story? What does that mean? It is not that he did not have the capacity, but his job is to be an advertisement. You get? So what does the evangelist do? He declares to you, come into this new season in God. Okay? And he introduces you to this for that is why he loses interest in you after you enter. You know there are very people who are very good at bringing you to master class. Do you understand? Do you get? There's nothing wrong with that person. That is how the fivefold works. Do you understand? So what is Christ making sure in this 
fivefold ministry, if you go to Ephesians, it says, so that they may bring maturity to the saints. You get? Who is a mature son? Isn't he a father? So they're supposed to be overseers and bishops. Do you get? So if she comes to this class, so the evangelist has brought her, okay? The pastor is working with her, okay? When, when, when she forgets and misses the way and goes to the club a little bit, the pastor is to say, don't worry. God is working on you. Pick you up. You understand? What is the teacher supposed to do? Now, this hard teaching you had from these two, this is how it applies in everyday life. You get. What are these guys supposed to do? The prophet is constantly checking and telling you, you know, the thing that God promised you is not yet. You still have to grow. You understand? That is what the prophet is supposed to be telling you. Do you get? You see? And what does God do with the apostle? He's constantly downloading revelation. Okay? So, what is happening? That the body of Christ is both able to ascend and descend. Do you understand? So that we are not dandas. This is a problem. So what happens is when she is brought into maturity, she is able to have sons. And therefore we greet the church that meets in her house. So that we don't need to have a mega church. <laughs> I have thrown a stone. Eh? Let me explain. If Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, okay, which is one church, and then he begins to greet the various churches that meet in their houses, what is he saying? He's saying that the church is not an assembly of people in a hall. It is an assembly of people in families. And not natural families, but in families of love. Do you understand? So this is why the emperor had a problem. Because these five, he can't appoint. You see, no matter how much you try, you can never receive revelation like an apostle. Unless you're chosen as one, correct? No matter how much you are trained, you cannot be a prophet unless you're called one. No matter how much you go to Bible school, you can never teach like someone who's been called to. No matter how much you want to care for people and be there for people, you can do it for two days then. <laughs> Unless you have the grace of a pastor. You cannot be constantly calling people into a season unless you have a grace of an evangelist. So he is in trouble because for as long as this five exist, he cannot control the church. Because constantly there is new revelation. Constantly there is teaching. You understand? So what do you do? Remove these buggers, move back, okay? And say, one of you, most likely the pastor, you are now the bishop. You understand? Okay. Can I tell you what happens to you when you only ever interact with a pastor? Your problems are always the same. <laughs> because he's forever encouraging you. <laughs> you get. <laughs> Can I help you again? Yeah. So if we choose and say, okay, we want the teacher. You become very smart. You can quote scriptures left, right, and center. But your life is not changing. So you just know, and you speak Christianese. <laughs> yes, yes, this is a paradigm shift in the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> I sense God is transitioning us into a place of power and purpose. Yeah. <laughs> and you look serious. Uh, this guy, his life is never moving, 
because all this teaching has no direction. Uh, when even worse, leave this prophet alone. Okay? He will tell you, I saw two rings in the sky. Okay? Two rings in the sky. And then they go on their own tangent because they do not have the revelation. So they tell you, Jesus is coming and is about to get married. I'm actually quoting one of them, so you understand. So, Jesus is about to get married. Conclusion, you need to repent. Okay. Let's think about it, okay? Jesus said he's coming for what kind of bride? A bride without blemish and without spot. So is he coming for a repentant church or a mature church? So why are we repenting? Why are we acting like we're in baby class? <laughs> so you leave a prophet alone, you're always doing exercises. You walk barefoot to claim Nairobi. So <laughs> prophetic action, claiming Nairobi, where our feet shall step, God has given us. You're very holy. And then you carry packets of salt. Salt covenant. This is a salt covenant. Yeah? And then when he comes to your house, he says, we need to dedicate this house. I sense. Why? Because they are without revelation. Do you get it? <laughs> are you seeing what, what the church is? I'm sure I've described pretty much. Oh, can I explain to you the evangelist church? There's always an altar call. You've been saved 10 years. Mama umeka nyumbani. Unaumia. Unaumia na tumbo kila siku. Bana leo na kuita. Ata kuponya sasa hivi. Njo, 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 njo. Suru, uwe, kuja. Ona umze. Unaitwa na mungu na usiki. Baki hapo, baki hapo, baki hapo, baki hapo. Receive. Next Sunday, kuna wengi wenyu bado, hamuja pata kazi. Mnaumia, same guy. Receive kazi. Now, God is nice. He's very nice. Imagine, in some of those places, God is actually touching his people. That's the truth. Oh, by there was one of those preachers, eh? So in case you think I'm dissing, you have no idea. I, I have, am I lying? You lift your hand. Uh, you see, I used to be one of those preachers until God opened my eyes. Do you know how he opened my eyes? I'm telling you these buggers would fall down. Then get up. Same problem, same character, same person. So I would go to the mountain. My friend, I fast for 21 days. You come down that mountain. Evangelist problems. Eh? Remember the evangelist does not know. He just advertises. Eh? So he, you don't have understanding. So you come power packed. So now you, you try new gimmicks. Shika. Shika. And everyone is excited. Can I explain to you what happens in such a church? In such a church, there's only one superpower. Only one guy who every Sunday we wait to do miracles. So Jesus gave us an example that by the poor called beautiful lay a lame man. Okay? And this lame man for 38 years, used to attend a powerful service. Where an angel of the Lord, remember that, would come and stir up the waters. Now let's pause. Someone who's been sent by God will come and just stir up the waters. Yani excite the waters. What does the waters mean? The word. Sindio, it means the word. What is his excuse that he's never gotten healed? That I have never been immersed in the word. 
It's just always been shallow. And therefore, I am paralyzed. And every person who attended that angel's service was always excited at the ripples of the word, the shallow end. That was the excitement. And if they were lucky, only one would get healed. So strange is this church that Jesus, who has sent the angel, is speaking to this man, and this man cannot recognize him. This guy can see the exciting service. He can see when the word is shaken, but he cannot tell when his master has come. He does not know him. So much so that even at, after he was healed, he's asked, who healed you? Do you know what he says? I do not know. Why? Because the water that he had was never deep enough. It never covered him completely. So what happens? This guy, whatever wind of doctrine comes his way, he is tossed. The guy who's led by the pastor is always weak and feeble because all the pastor has trained him is to rely on him. Pastor, I'm to ni mgonjwa. Pastor, niko na homa. Si tutembe. Pastor, tumegumbana na bibi yangu. Pastor, mamango amekufa. All right? Okay, this is what the church is always. So we have a lame church because we've never learned to walk. Do you understand? Because all he knows is how to be there for you. Then you have this guy, he's called a teacher. And all he does is make you a theologian. And he can explain hard words to you. Okay? Shekinah glory. <laughs> Transformational leadership. Ecclesia. Rehoboth. You understand? The Greek and the Hebrew. You understand? So you know a lot of stuff. But you just can't apply it. Do you get it? Yeah. Then, you've got the church which is under the prophet. It is always Jesus is coming soon. And I sense in the spirit there's a disturbance. Shh, quiet. Everyone. <laughs> close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. I want you to see angels. Because that's his focus. So what are you always trying to do? To dream, to see. That's what your focus is. You even forget to live. Yeah. Because when you copy the lifestyle of a prophet, you are in trouble. You see, Isaiah was told to sleep on one side for six months. Can you imagine if Isaiah taught all of Israel to sleep on one side for six months? Do you guys understand the madness that is in our church today? You understand? We need to restore the guys who carry the ark of God. Amen? Then what needs to happen is their work is to continually seek after God. To find what is this new revelation, new understanding, new level that the church needs to get into, okay? And bring this guy. Now, when this guy is brought by me, okay, the evangelist, he's working with the pastor, okay? Now, I want you to picture this. He's been brought in. He's working with a teacher. There's a prophet saying the way, okay? There's an apostle declaring how strong is that person? How strong is that? 
Do you understand? Because when he's standing still, the prophet is there to push him forward. When he can't understand, the teacher is there to explain. When he's fallen and he's wounded, the pastor is there to support him. When he's finished that class, the apostle is there to declare a new season. So there's always movement in the body. Am I making sense, guys? Wow, wow, my time is running. Are we okay? Do you understand Uza's story? Okay? So let me bring Uza's story into this dynamic. Go back to your position there, Mr. Charismatic guy. Okay? Go back to your positions, right? Now, remember this guy? Okay? Every time he receives, okay, the presence of God. You know how you used to leave that service and you una, una feel God? Yeah. You know, you feel God. Yeah. And you think you'll never sin again because yani, you will una feel God. <laughs> but what happens when you meet the threshing floor? Did you notice you always lost it? Did you notice you always fell apart? <coughs> Did you ever notice that? Because every time you use a Philistine cart, you use a system that is not of God, when the test comes, you fail. Do you get it? Every time the church has been assembled like that, and a test called election comes, we become tribes. So every lawyer bishop is prophesying NASA. Every Kikuyu bishop is prophesying Jubilee. Why? Because every time a test comes, Uza dies. Do you get it? Do you understand? And you fail to bring the presence of God. Okay? Thank you so much. Let me finish this story. Thank you guys for volunteering. Brilliant actors, aren't they? Okay? Now, with that understanding, it brings me to the last part that I want to build a picture for you to understand. Okay? If you go back to the Herodians, okay? If you go back to the Herod and the Herodians, you realize something. Other than building a structure that was not from God, you realize something very interesting. And I don't know, Elam, do you have the part where I, I brought the edict? There's some very interesting change that was done. First, you know the term church? Jesus never used it. Eh? He used the term ecclesia. And I just want to quickly draw the difference. It's not the focus of this teaching. But I quickly want to draw the difference so that you can understand the topics that are coming. The term Ecclesia is what he says, on this rock I will build my ecclesia. Okay? What Christ said, I will build my parliament. Now let me explain to you why that was an explosive statement. Okay? In Caesar's government, he had an ecclesia. Herod was part of Caesar's ecclesia. You understand? So what was Christ saying? That every time we met, we declared laws by which the earth was to be governed. That's why he could say, whatever you bind on earth is also bound in heaven. Does that make sense? In other words, that the meeting of this group of people legislated the earth. This is why the ecclesia is called the light of the world. You see, parliament is the light of Kenya. How so? Parliament sits down and decides, by the way, a tax is now 15%. Everyone lives according to that standard. We are bound to it. We are bound by law. Okay? So when Jesus was saying, whatsoever you bind on earth, he meant whatever law this body makes is the law of heaven and earth. Do you understand? So, Herod's problem and why Jesus was killed 
and why the apostles were persecuted. You know, we've always thought that they were persecuted because they taught Jesus. No. They were persecuted because they taught the Lord Jesus. You understand? They taught that every time we meet, we have equal power, if not greater, than the emperor's power. Do you understand why they were persecuted? Now, do you understand who you are? And do you understand what you were robbed of? Do you get? Because, think of it this way. Can you imagine that masterclass is a more powerful platform than the August house in town? Eh, yeah, you see? This is what we are missing. Remember, beware the living of the Herodians. You see, what you've been convinced is somehow the state is above the church. Sindio? Because today, it is the state that gives the church right to exist. So you have to register a society yeah. under the laws of Kenya. Where did that come from? Constantine. <laughs> Do you get it? So in your minds, it is still very important who gets to be president August 8th. Because to you, the church is here and the state is? This is the Herodian system. Because it is the state that appointed the temple and the temple officials. Christ's order is that Christ appoints his body. He appoints his church. And if this ecclesia, which is called by his that's why he said, if two or three of you gather in my name. Now, I've explained to you before what my name means. It means as accurately representing Christ. Since that's what parliamentarians do. Parliamentarians represent their regions. Now, the parliament of Christ is, works the other way. Okay, let me explain. In a secular state, the power is in the people visited on the president, correct? In the kingdom of God... All power and all authority belongs to Christ. So we are representatives of him. It works the other way. You understand? So when we gather as representing him, do you understand? Whatsoever we bind on earth, we also bind in. Do you understand how his parliament works? How his ecclesia works? Do you understand? And therefore he says, in this state, if you repent, okay, and pray, I will heal the land. So you don't bother with Uhuru and Raila. We bother with master class. And we bother with the other master classes, if I may call them that. Ecclesias that are meeting within Nairobi. If those will turn from their wicked ways. So stop asking why is Kenya corrupt. We are the ones who are corrupt us. Stop asking at who's fighting. It's us. Because if the light is able to shine, the darkness cannot stand. So what happened? Both Constantine and King James, okay? I don't know whether, do you have King James's edict? I sent it to you. Edict number three. It says the term all ecclesiastical statements shall be removed from your Bible and replaced with the term church. If you can't find it, just Google King James Edict number three. There were, he had 15 edicts to the translation of your Bible. Then he said, translate the Bible, but kuna vitu zingine usigu? Do not call them a parliament. Do not call them a congregation. Call them a church. Why were we called a church? So that we could be robbed of the power of parliament. Do you understand? Because the term church means belonging to a Lord. It is translated from the Greek word kuriakos, the Lord. So it sounds good. Okay? But you see, the problem is if I insert Lord, there are very many different Lords. And that's why people have my church. Do you understand? Because Jesus said, on this rock I will build my church. That means you can have your church. 
That is why in their church, they eat grass. That's why in their church, they spray people with doom. That's why in their church, they can sell you anointing. In their church. Remember, it says that if you teach the truth, they'll kick you out of their synagogues. <laughs> Do you get it? Guys, am I making sense? So you need to be upgraded in your mind, okay? To be upgraded in your mind that you are more powerful than your MP. You're more powerful than the president of this republic. Can I prove it to you? There's a guy called Daniel. Between him and Nebuchadnezzar, who's running the country? Daniel was running the country, correct? Cindy? So between the one who can hear God and descend and ascend from heaven and the one who rules an earthly kingdom, who is greater? Therefore Jesus, when he's asked by Pilate, are you a king? It's the only he answers because it's the only relevant one. He says, My kingdom is not of this earth. My kingdom is higher. My kingdom is so high that I can command angels to rescue me. But because I have a job to do, I will let you persecute me. Do you understand? Listen. It says something, you've not found it, Elam? Okay. It says something interesting in the book of Acts. It says that those who've turned the world upside down have come here also. And that is the city they wanted to stone Paul. <coughs> Do you know why? When Paul preached the gospel, the economy of that city turned <laughs> upside down. The silver trade issues. Okay? When Moses is removing all the slaves out of Egypt, what happened to the labor force? When Elijah said it shall not rain for seven years, except by his word, what happened to the agricultural industry? When the disciples and the followers of Christ removed their money from the economy of Jerusalem. And suddenly people were bringing offerings and tithes to the feet of the apostles versus Herod's temple. What happened to the temple tax? Do you understand why they had problems with these guys? It is because they represented a government. Do you get it? The old ecclesiastical words to be kept vis the word church, not to be translated, not to be translated anything near a congregation, a parliament, called out ones. Do not dare call them that. Do not tell them. Do you know what ecclesia means? Ek means called, leisure called out. Okay? So, it means do not tell them who they really are. Because if we tell them who they really are, I cannot remain king. If I tell you who you really are, the weather patterns will never scare you. Election cycles will never scare you. Because can I tell you something else about Daniel? Do you know how many kings he survived? Foreign kings? Four. So tell me who was in charge. One king, listen, imagine Bill Clinton comes and leaves. You are still advising the White House. Bush comes and leaves. You are still advising the White House. Obama comes and leaves. You are still advising Trump. 
No, you, you, you know you think Akina, 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 Nebuchadnezzar are nice people. Eh? This is a guy who would throw you into the fire like it's uh, a Saturday barbecue. So these were not nice people. But because Daniel understood his position, he was able to do what? To transcend the rulership of whoever is on earth. Because he understood that his position is he's the only one who's able to access heaven and tell earth what to do. Do you understand? So whatever you bind on earth is bound in. You're able to ascend and this is what makes you different to everyone else. This is what makes you a royal priesthood, a chosen generation. In other words, out of everyone on earth, when God was looking for someone to represent him, he chose you. And because the devil, listen, on this rock I will build my, and the gates of hell shall not. Okay? So the devil knew if you understand what that term, ecclesia there meant, he cannot touch you. So how does he touch you? You don't know who you are. So you say statements like, I'm going to church. So how are you, the house of God, going to the house of God? Because they lied to you again and they told you that the church is a building, not you. So they robbed you of your identity. Do you get it? And if they couldn't rob you in, of your identity, they made you the cripple. They made you the crazy guy. So the church is always looking crazy. No, have, you, have you read the news? I read Crazy Monday. We look insane. Do you know why? We've been robbed of who we are. Do you get it? The old ecclesiastical words to be kept as the word church, not to be translated congregation. Don't you dare. Because the moment you understand who you are, this world can't contain you. You understand? You will break forth like a mighty flood. When you understand, now go back to the first slide, I want to explain a few things. When you understand that you come from a different kingdom, you will stop struggling with certain things. The only commodity in the kingdom, it is called peace. Jesus said, I'm, I'm just going to run through this so you understand what I'm trying to do here. The commodity of peace, Jesus said, when you go into a house, Give them your peace. Give them your peace. It is what we have. My peace I give unto you. That's what Jesus gave us. Not a shamba, not a range rover. He gave us his peace. So what is this thing that you are given? Do you know it? The only description of it is, Mazeni kona stress, but I have peace. <laughs> That's what you know. You've got one dimension of your inheritance. That's the only one that you know. So what is this commodity? It says, I give you my peace. So Peter and John say, silver and gold have we, but such as we have give we unto you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. They had the miracle in them. Amen? Do you know what you have? If I asked you to give me what you have, will you give me your car keys? Give me your house. Can you give me your peace? Ascending and descending, heaven on earth, correct? Jesus said, my peace I give unto. So you have the right to give it because he said, when you enter into a house, give them your peace. So I challenge you, give me your peace. Do you know how? And you wonder why you struggle. Because you don't know how even to get that peace. You think that peace is the ability to sleep at night <laughs> when, when your landlord is on your case. Okay? 
the economy of grace. It says Christ came full of light and full of grace. So when his body was broken, what came out? Light and grace. So what is it? How does that economy work? How do I multiply grace? It says when you give, Corinthians 8, God is 8 and 9, God is able to make all grace abound unto you. Do you know how to abound in grace? But you know how to ask for a pay rise. <laughs> but you don't know how to be promoted in the economy of your kingdom. Are you seeing where you're in trouble? Because the problem is you're asking for cash and God gives you grace. And you do not have a currency converter. <laughs> Listen, if you belong to another kingdom, it stands to reason that it has another currency. Sindio? So if I am an American ambassador and I am paid in dollars, and I receive a pay rise in dollars, and I do not know how to convert it to Kenya shillings, I will die of hunger. So what is your problem? You don't know how to convert grace to food. The budget of giving. Can I tell you something funny? I'm just demonstrating these things. And by the way, please stick through these lessons. Okay? It's important. I'm not saying that because I want you to attend, by the way. It's because I care for your soul. And I'll tell you why when I finish. The budget of giving. You know we've mistaught this thing in church. It says, give and it will come back to you. Good measure. Shaken down. Pressed together. Running over. See scripture in Asia Liar. The scripture says, shall men give unto your bosom. Read it. Okay? So the question <laughs> is Jesus is telling me that if I'm going to budget my life, I must budget it by giving. You see, the difference between us and the world is we budget in the world by kukunyima. It's called saving. That's what we do. You get? So I plan according to nikonatao. Because we were taught that scripture halfway. So we know where to give. Usually it is the preacher with a loud voice. Okay? Did they tell you where to receive? So question, doesn't the Bible say there's a time to give and a time to? So why are we always saying giving time? Blessing time. Ask him and receiving time? <laughs> No. No, listen. It says there's a time to give and to receive. So it's okay. You've taught me to give. Teach me to receive. Yeah? Because usually what happens is him, you give him physical cash. And you, you are supposed to have some amorphous thing happen to you. Sindio? But why does the Bible specifically say that shall men give to your bosom. It, notice, it is you giving to men and men giving to you. <laughs> so sometimes we put God in equations anyway. The administration of love. You notice that Jesus did not have rank among his disciples. Jesus was so rankless that the whole point Judas betrayed him is because they could not tell the difference between him and his disciples. So Judas had to tell them, the one I kiss, that is the one. <laughs> because Atumju? So much so that how many times did he just disappear into the crowd? So he was not walking around with a collar and identify me, I'm the bishop. Everyone who recognized Jesus had to discern him. 
It was not a physical thing. You had to know him. So, the body of Christ is not administered by rank. That's the military. So, kuna pastor, senior pastor, executive pastor. Kimaliz up when end up bishop. And I always wonder, are you people insane? Did you ever see senior teacher? <laughs> senior prophet? Or mightiest prophet? Did you ever see that? <laughs> Do you get? So we have taken another Philistine cut and we've given ourselves ranks. You get? Me, I always wonder, manze, e prophet, exam, e koapi. Kusabka kuna mightiest as me kuena mightier na mighty prophet. Kusabka kulikuwa na exam. Si lazima kukompare. It is comparative. So, how does God administrate his kingdom? It's about love. You get? That is why in master class, you can ask anything. You can come and teach. You can do whatever. Because it is your father's house. It is your father's house. So why is there one person? The administration of love. How do we translate from this physical administration we've inherited to be able to love one another and therefore submit one to the other. Can I give you a revelation that God gave me the other day, Pentecost? You know how we've taught Pentecost is about miracles and stuff like that, but did you ever realize that the disciples did miracles before? So Pentecost was not about miracles. It was about love because they were in one accord. Amen? The might of the sheep. This is very strange because Jesus said, I'm sending you as sheep among wolves. So how does a sheep protect itself from wolves? We are considered as sheep for the slaughter all the day long. Every day. So how does a sheep become mighty among wolves? The problem with us is this is how we behave. He knew Christo. <laughs> so now biashara nikiwa na deni yako wolf alafu sande sheep <laughs> beware the sheep in wolf's clothing not the wolf in sheep's clothing okay the city of houses how do we build a community that is a city that is safe and secure for ourselves? The funny thing is, the Muslims know how to do this. They build cities everywhere. There is a city in Nairobi called Isili, city in Nairobi called South B, South C, where they live together. You understand? Have you seen them poor? Sindio? So, if your God is the real one, why are you poor? <laughs> if I serve the real God, why am I the servant? Yet he said you shall be the head and not. But if you go and check most tales, <laughs> the enemies within. You see, one of the things you must understand about your land of promise it always has seven tribes greater than? So what are these tribes? What are they? How do you conquer? Okay? Now when you conquer your enemies, what is the Zion position? The Zion position is the place where God comes to rest. This is the fulfillment of every promise God has even ever given you. Then how do you work and rest? Because it's a funny thing. In Genesis, God rested from all his work. And then Jesus comes and says, my father is always working. So did Jesus lie? <laughs> so what is rest? You see, we don't understand. This is why we live in a generation obsessed with a thing called a vacation. Narudishi <laughs> ya 
Asante. And me, I'm always looking at you and wonder how much time do you have? Do you understand? Because we are called to work from rest. I'm telling you this is important because if you've been in master class long enough, you know that the things that we teach you are hard. And one of the things I guarantee you is what you learn must be tested. Okay? And I'm beginning to get very tired of counseling a lot of people. So I have one new rule. Before you come for counseling, listen to everything. <laughs> you come for counseling for things I have not taught. Nani chosha. And it is not fair. Do you think it's fair? I don't charge for counseling, so I can say what I want. You see the beauty. <laughs> this is the beauty of being set free from pleasing you. You understand? Why am I saying this? Please learn to completion. Because what I've begun to realize is happening. Someone comes and thinks because they've learned one great thing, they can go change the world. Then you disappear for a month. Then I must begin to teach you what everyone else has gone through. But when I look at people like Paula, who's been here from beginning to end, I see them moving and being able to grow from faith to faith and from glory to glory. You understand? So I'm not asking for your attendance because I want to fill chairs. I'm asking for your attendance because Staki Kuchoka. Can I be honest? You understand? You know Jesus did not run a counseling ministry. Most of his counseling sessions were very easy. What must I do to born, be born again? Keep the law. I have kept it since I was young. Okay, sell all you have. And the young man walked away. Notice Jesus did not go after him. So I am like Jesus. I will not come after you. <laughs> That's the truth. The time for the church to run after you. Where have you been? Bono Jakuja service. Have I ever called you? It's not about to start. Because you must learn how Jesus walked. You understand? You must learn that. And this thing, let me tell you, it's so interesting. Let me finish by this. There are two things that are very interesting. That there are 72 who began following Jesus at the end there was zero. Until he had to, you know the whole point why Jesus had to stay on earth after he was resurrected? Because he had to return like in a Peter. They had gone back to fishing, a mouse. You understand? Why is this a critical lesson? It is a critical lesson because you need to understand that 70 years after Jesus left this earth, there were still Pharisees. Isn't that funny? Jesus has come and gone, and you're still Pharisee. So in other words, you need to learn to transition with Christ. You get? Sir, so I'm asking you for your own benefit, please finish. Because the word we are teaching, let me tell you, persecution comes because of the word. How do you stand persecution? By getting more word. So please don't get malnourished. Alafu ni pigie midnight. Tumekubaliana? Sir, if you have a question about this, I'm willing to engage with you. Sir, but let's stay the train. 